Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Kishaw Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, and it gives me, gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this lecture on just business. <laughs> uh, as you all know, when I uh, speak at these events, I make three, point, three quick points, uh, and then I'll pass the floor to our guest speaker, uh, John Ruggie, uh, who told me that he'll only speak for a couple of hours, that's all. <laughs> uh, my three quick points. First is, of course, about the United Nations. And as you know, uh, this is an organization that many of us believe is very important, but is also heavily maligned all the time. There are people who are always demonizing the UN, and there are people who believe that the UN represents the future. And I think one club, that exclusive club that John Ruggie and I belong to, is that we are fellow believers uh, in the United Nations. And this book that he's just produced, Just Business, uh, and you, you see why you have to buy it after you hear the talk, is dedicated to Kofi Annan, a mutual friend of John's and mine. And in fact, Kofi Annan, as you all know, may know, was the first Lee Ka Sheng professor uh, at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. So this is a home for UN believers here, and I'm glad that John Ruggie is here. My second point is about the topic, and I guess, uh, obviously, uh, John is going to say much more about the topic, but the area of business is, is a very good example of how the UN uh, can make a big difference. If you watch how uh, the reputation of business corporations uh, in many parts of the world went down, take the case of Bhopal, and I'm glad you discussed Bhopal uh, in this book. This look at the case of Shell in Nigeria, which you also uh, discussed. You can see how people began to distrust uh, business in many countries, and people thought that this was a gulf within business and society, or business and civil society that could not be bridged, uh, could not be bridged and here the work of John Ruggie clearly shows that you can make a difference in this area. Um, now my third and final point is about uh, our speaker. Now if I read his entire bio, it might take a couple of hours. <laughs> so I'll be very brief and uh, describe a few highlights uh, of his life. He's now the Berthold Bites Professor in Human Rights and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School, which some of you may know also is a partner school of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. Uh, he was trained as a political science student at McMaster University and the University of California, Berkeley, and he obtained his PhD from Berkeley in 1974. He taught political science at Berkeley until 1978 before moving to a teaching position uh, at Columbia. He returned to the University of California system in 1989 served as director of the UC Institute on Global Conflict and Cooperation until 1991 before assuming the position of Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, where he held until, which he held until 1996. SIPA, by the way, at Columbia, is also a partner of the Lee Kuan Yew School, uh, and we are both members of the Global Public Policy uh, Network. Uh, I'm not sure whether John will tell you what, uh, what his experience as Dean was, but if you want to, you can go ahead. <laughs> in 1997, he served as Assistant Secretary General and Senior Advisor for Strategic Planning to the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan until 2001, and that's when actually we, went, we came to work closely together, especially in developing the UN Millennium Development Goals of the year uh, 2000. Uh, in his capacity as ESG, a post created for him by Kofi Annan, he established and oversaw the UN Global Compact, the world's largest corporate citizenship initiative, and worked on gaining General Assembly approval for the MDGs. Uh, he then served as a Kirkpatrick Professor of International Affairs and Director of the Mosava Ramani Center for Business and Government at the Harvard Kennedy School. In 2005, Secretary General Annan appointed jo John as the special representative on the issue of human rights and transnational cooperation and other business enterprises. 
a mandate requested by the UN Commission for Human Rights and approved by ECOSOC. He stayed on this mandate till 2011 and served, also served under, under Secretary General Mr. Ban Ki-moon. And in, in a remarkable achievement in the year two, 2011, the UN Human Rights Council, which rarely agrees on anything unanimously, uh, this is a fact, by the way, unanimously endorsed the principles on business and human rights, informally known as the rugby rules, which were developed under John's leadership. And that was a spectacular uh, achievement, uh, I can tell you. Now, for all his good work, he's received uh, many awards and uh, mentions. So I just mentioned two. Uh, a recent survey published in Foreign Policy magazine identified him as one of the 25 most influential international relations scholars in the United States and Canada. In addition, the Ethical Co uh, Corporation magazine published in the UK named Ruggi among its top 10 ethical leaders for 2008. So you have both a brilliant and ethical mind to address us today. John, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kishore, for those um, all too kind words. Um, you know, if my mother had been here, she might have believed you. <laughs> um, what Kishore was referring to um, uh, about deans, uh, we, uh, we had dinner the other night and I shared with him what someone said to me uh, when I became dean of uh, SIPA at Columbia University. It's a great honor uh, that uh, you have now taken this position, but you should remember that a dean is to a faculty what a fire hydrant is to a dog. <laughs> and that was the beginning. <laughs> so it's a great pleasure to, to, uh, to be here. Thank you for, for, for coming out uh, uh, this afternoon. And, uh, um, I've, Kishore um, and I have known each other a long time. It's a great honor for me to have been asked um, to come and speak about the uh, issue of business and human rights, which is something, as Kishore mentioned, that has preoccupied me now for a number of years. Um, what I'd like to do is to, um, I, I, wa I want to address the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights because uh, I think they are an important and unusual instrument, but I'd like to put it into a broader context uh, about um, why and how and what the implications are um, for uh, business and human rights, for governance, and for the study of public policy. Uh, this is a school of, a very distinguished school of public policy, so I want to address those dimensions um, as well. Um, and I guess the, the starting point is why did business and human rights become um, a major um, uh, issue of concern on the international agenda to begin with? I don't know if everybody can see um, what uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the slides here, but um, in essence, to cut a long story short, uh, it was a byproduct of globalization. Um, as you know, um, in the 1990s, um, or it, the takeoff really was in the 1990s, um, a, um, a vast expansion um, of uh, international uh, business activity. Um, the um, um, markets expanded, deregulation took place, privatization took place, this led to an outburst of, of international economic activity, tying nations and their fates more and more closely together. Um, the, um, the rights of businesses to operate globally uh, expanded significantly through the protection of intellectual property rights, for example, through bilateral investment treaties under which an investor can sue a government uh, if the government undertakes measures uh, that upset the economic equilibrium of the investment to begin with, and so on and so forth. So the, the rights and the ability of business to operate globally expanded vastly. Um, and this had obviously um, enormous um, positive contributions. Um, Kishore mentioned the Millennium Development Goals. The poverty reduction that went along with this has been uh, truly uh, impressive. Um, the rise of the BRICS, uh, the global economic power redistribution that has resulted in, in, in from um, uh, globalization and so on and so forth. But 
Um, the challenge, uh, of course, was, uh, and to some extent remains, that um, the uh, economic um, uh, drivers uh, which took off uh, left behind um, many people. Uh, environmental uh, social regulations did not keep pace. Uh, environmental impacts were not adequately regulated um, uh, as a result um, of uh, this um, outburst of globalization. Um, and we have, um, I put on, on here the, the uh, example of, of the Rana Plaza building collapse in Bangladesh, which sort of tells the story in miniature. Whose fault was it? Well, it was everybody's fault, right? The Bangladesh government, Bangladeshi government to begin with, um, inadequate uh, safety regulations, inadequate labor protections, uh, corruption in the government. Um, many of the factory owners, in fact, sit in the parliament and they sit there to protect their interests, not simply to, to pursue the public interest. Uh, the factory owners themselves, this particular one, um, um, was um, um, recently arrested um, uh, for uh, 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 violating um, uh, the building codes that uh, were barely adequate to begin with. The international brands, um, Walmart um, and, and, and the other uh, international retailers uh, are responsible to some extent. Um, the margins in the apparel industry are paper thin. The pressure to produce um, on short deadlines um, is enormous. Uh, the willingness of the brands to invest in improvements uh, is limited, uh, typically to the high-end producers. Um, Home governments, uh, the governments of the countries that the brands um, are domiciled in, um, have not pr played a significant role uh, in improving uh, the performance of the brands. And international law and institutions typically are laggard rather than leading indicators. And so you have the whole story of an asymmetry of increasingly integrated markets uh, yet fragmented authority and regulatory structures lagging behind. So the question was how to embed human rights standards um, in this process um, more effectively than it has in the past. Now, I'll run through this very quickly. There are conventional approaches, traditional approaches to this. Traditional approach number one, let's have a treaty. Right. Okay, so... Um, Jump to the bottom here. Um, the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which is not legally binding, took 26 years to negotiate. What do we do in the meantime? We have to move more quickly on other fronts, even if we want to uh, support the idea of negotiating some overarching legal um, instrument. The second um, sort of traditional approach uh, voluntarism, voluntary initiatives. Uh, voluntary initiatives um, are extremely important contributors and they've increased rapidly since the year 2000, but they're still very limited in number. They are at the discretion of a company. A company defines what uh, standards it chooses to adhere to and they may or may not be adequate under the circumstances. Um, typically, voluntary initiatives lack uh, external accountability, um, and there's no, there's no source of redress. You can't go somewhere to lodge a claim uh, to say, uh, you have harmed me, uh, and now um, we need to do something about the harm. Extraterritorial jurisdiction by home states is limited um, typically to uh, the worst forms of abuses bordering on or actually um, um, amounting to um, internationally recognized crimes. Now, all of these make a contribution, but there is no silver bullet. And that was the beginning of my thinking in the mandate, that there is no, uh, the UN um, mandate, that there is no single silver bullet. What we need uh, is to uh, add um, some new elements into the mix, and that's what my mandate um, in the UN was intended to do. Now. Initially, I was simply asked to identify and clarify existing standards. What are, what, what are the international standards um, that, um, um, that states ought to adhere to when it comes to business and human rights? 
Are there any standards that businesses should adhere to uh, in the area of business and human rights? Uh, gradually, what we uh, ended up doing was not to invent new standards, but rather to elaborate what the meanings are, what the implications are of existing standards, and then get agreement that, yes, that is the meaning that we as governments and we as businesses um, support. So, for example, states have always known that as part of the international human rights regime, it's their job to protect against human rights abuses no matter by whom they are committed. And third parties um, include businesses. But what that implies specifically had never been laid out authoritatively. What kind of regulations? Um, over what sorts of issues? How do you do it? That, the, that had been left virtually entirely to the discretion of individual governments. There was no general consensus. Similarly, for the voluntary initiatives that companies had undertaken, it, there was no authoritative basis for them. And so what we essentially did was we addressed the question of how. Internationally recognized human rights are there. Labor rights are there. The, um, uh, the need to respond to community um, uh, uh, complaints are, are there. What was lacking was an authoritative interpretation of how to do those things um, on the global uh, scale. Now, the um, process that um, we undertook involved nearly 50 international consultations over a six-year period. Uh, it involved pilot projects, um, all stakeholder groups um, in all regions um, of the world. Um, a couple of examples of consultations. Um, we actually went to um, nice apparel in Bangkok, and it actually was nice apparel. They did a good job, not only with the apparel, but also with safety standards and also with basic labor issues. On the bottom left is one of my favorites, and this shows you um, how rapidly this field is changing. That picture was taken in Casanare, Colombia. The, uh, um, the person standing next to my lovely wife is the brigade commander of an what was once an infamous army brigade in Colombia. So the 16th Army Brigade had been involved um, in uh, killings of um, locals, of citizens, of labor organizers. The, uh, install one of the installations that they are protecting uh, was, a B was a British Petroleum, a BP uh, natural gas uh, installation. BP hired the International Red Cross to provide human rights training to the 16th Army Brigade. And this was at the Human Rights Training Center of the, British, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, 16th Army Brigade, um, where um, the soldiers um, were interacted with the community and were taught, literally, how to behave if, if there's a demonstration, how to behave if uh, they come across a, a, a member of the, uh, of the FARC, the revolutionary um, um, leftist guerrilla group, uh, and so on and so forth. And as you see, the kids look relatively happy because no one is shooting these days because they've now been adequately trained um, in basic human rights. The result of these consultations, as Kishore mentioned, were the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, uh, unanimously endorsed by the uh, Human Rights Council. Um, the, it was two, um, it, it, this uh, uh, unanimous endorsement uh, represented two firsts. Um, one first was that it was the first time that the UN Human Rights Council um, had ever um, issued any authoritative guidance on business and human rights. Uh, and it also was the first time that the uh, Human Rights Council or its predecessor body had ever endorsed a normative text that governments did not negotiate themselves. Um, my team and I developed the guiding principles through consultations, 
presented them to the Human Rights Council uh, and said, please endorse these, and they did, and they did so unanimously. Now, why and how did this happen? It's a long story, and I'm not sure that we can cover all of it this afternoon. But for those of you who study international politics, you may recognize the concept of polycentric governance. That is to say, governance by the collaboration of multiple centers of governance. In this case, public governance, civil governance, and corporate governance. What we tried to link together, literally, were the different modes of discourse. Govern governments have legal obligations uh, in, under the international human rights regime. So the language that we spoke to governments was the language of legal obligations and policy rationales that support those legal obligations. Protecting against human rights abuses means adequate regulation, adequate adjudication, um, and so on and so forth. That's for states. For companies, we took a very different approach. For companies, we said, look, you increasingly face risks that are related to your non not recognizing the need to respect human rights. You get sued in courts, NGOs organize advocacy campaigns against you, you have operational risks, interruptions of uh, pipelines being blown up, um, access roads to mines being shut down. Um, those are risks that you face that are increasingly imposing costs on you, we will work with you to show how to manage those risks more adequately. So you have legal obligations and policy rationales um, addressed to governments. You have essentially a risk-based mode of discourse addressed to the business community. And thirdly, to affected individuals and communities, the, 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 their right to adequate remedies for harm done and so the idea was to combine these three rationales in one set of principles um, um, that um, the Human Rights Council could address and uh, endorse. Now, these principles led to the uh, protect, respect, and remedy framework. Um, the state duty to protect against human rights abuses, including by third parties, such as business, requires um, states to prevent, investigate, redress, and punish abuses through effective policies, legislation, uh, and so on. This is laid out in 10 principles um, of the guiding principles. For companies, respecting human rights means to avoid infringing on the rights of others. And how do you do that? Through a human rights due diligence process through adequate human rights impact assessments, through integrating the findings of those impact assessments across different business functions, um, and, and um, addressing harm where it does, where it has occurred. For those who are adversely affected, um, access to remedy is laid out um, in seven principles, including non-judicial remedy, uh, remedies, uh, such as um, site-level grievance mechanisms. Um, a company um, establishing its own grievance mechanism that uh, can address uh, issues as they arise before they escalate into major human rights uh, confrontations. So, the blending of these three rationales fed into the guiding uh, principles. As we were doing that, we also wanted to make certain that the guiding principles had a life well beyond the, uh, the domain of the United Nations. Kishore and I are great fans of the United Nations, but we also understand its limitations. Um, we understand that the UN in itself has relatively few implementation mechanisms that it can put to work. 
And so we started to collaborate with a number of other international standard setting bodies that have far greater leverage vis-a-vis -vis business activities than the United Nations um, itself. The International Organization of Standardization, ISO. ISO has recently adopted ISO 26000, a corporate responsibility, a, a social responsibility standard. It has a human rights chapter. Where did the human rights chapter come from? It came from the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. International Finance Corporation affects access to capital. Um, they have, for the first time, explicit reference to the, bus uh, that the, the, the requirement that business respect human rights as a condition of getting low, um, in, in, uh, investment capital from the International Finance Corporation. The um, IFC standards, in turn, are tracked by banks that adhere, uh, private sector banks that adhere to the so-called equator principles. This is um, um, for project lending purposes. 80% um, of project lending in the world is now covered by the equator principles. So they track the IFC standards. The IFC standards track the UN guiding principles. So you see the ripple effect that we were trying to create, not simply have the UN endorse something and then go home, but rather to, uh, to plant the seeds in a variety of other places as well. The European Union has endorsed the guiding principles. Each member state uh, is in the process of developing national implementation plans for the guiding principles. The OECD, again, almost verbatim, uh, uh, in, developed a new uh, human rights chapter for their own guidelines for multinational businesses. Um, and uh, that's important because it includes an international complaints mechanism. It has filtered into, the guiding principles have filtered into national regulations. The US government, when it lifted sanctions on Myanmar, uh, imposed a reporting requirement any American investor investing more than $500,000 in Myanmar is required to annually report, including on human rights, against the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Uh, there's been important um, support from international business associations. China uh, is uh, rapidly adopting parallel standards for its own overseas investment. Um, it's actively promoting the ISO 26000 standard, uh, which, as I said, is almost verbatim um, on the issue of human rights from the UN guiding principles. And so increasingly, the guiding principles provide the source for um, other um, standard setting bodies, both national and international. Um, I spoke to a, to a group um, at, at lunchtime today. Thomas, uh, uh, Thomas was, was there. And I, I mentioned an interesting story that was recently imported, uh, re reported um, in the press uh, about China um, trying to improve its image in Myanmar. Uh, very interesting story. Um, the pipelines that are being built, uh, constructed from the Bay of Bengal to Yunnan province. Um, there have been operational disruptions from communities around it. Uh, costs are escalating. Um, and China um, has taken uh, some unusual steps to respond to community pressures, um, very much in line with the grievance mechanism approach that we outlined in the UN guiding principles. Among other things, what they've done is they've put up a Facebook page in their embassy uh, in Myanmar. As you know, you, there are no Facebook pages in China itself, but there is one at the Chinese embassy in Myanmar that community members uh, can uh, um, um, interact uh, with the authorities on. Um, the, the head of the political section of the Chinese embassy in Yangon was quoted um, in this news report, and I want to read this to you. His name is Gao Mingbo, um, and he said, the companies 
speaking of Sinopec, right, the companies um, are involved here. Um, one is a natural gas pipeline, the other is an oil pipeline. The companies must retain the support of the local communities. That has been the consistent message of the embassy, to be open, to be engaged. Um, and then uh, the story goes on to mention the Facebook page. And then um, um, uh, he's quoted again, he said, if you don't walk the walk and just talk the talk, you won't win the hearts and minds of the local people. Good. We've made progress. We're making progress. So somebody asked me at this business lunch today, how would you engage the Singaporean business community to take these issues seriously? I said, I would point them to this story that China, in fact, is not only adopting some of these same practices, but even um, actively engaging with the news media to promote the idea that China is on board with certain standards in the area of business and human rights. And if Sinopec and the Chinese government uh, have turned the corner, then everybody uh, is turning the corner very rapidly. And I'm very happy to see that. Now, forgive me for um, this um, sort of post-Cubist representation um, of my story, but what I want to do, I mentioned before three governance systems at the global level and our trying to align um, them behind a single normative framework, the system of public governance, civil governance, and corporate governance. Now, where they intersect, the sweet spot, as it were, uh, of this Venn diagram, is the earliest uptake by companies and by governments of the UN guiding principles has been in two areas. Due diligence requirements, on the one hand, and grievance mechanisms, on the other. Now, it's, on reflection, it's obvious why that's the case. Due diligence requirements are preventative. Governments find it much easier to tell businesses how to prevent um, problems than they do creating new liability standards. Creating new liability standards is, li is likely to arouse business opposition um, and it's likely to lead to long debates, but preventative measures such as due diligence requirements is something that governments are, are more um, uh, at ease doing in the short run. Civil governance, uh, the NGO community, the affected communities, why are they interested in due diligence? Because it avoids problems to begin with. It, you don't, you don't ha, you, it, it's not an after the fact um, uh, correction of something that has been done, you avoid problems to begin with. Corporate governance, why are companies increasingly interested in these things? because it reduces the risk um, um, uh, of, of, of getting involved um, in human rights abuses that can lead to serious uh, consequences, both financial and otherwise. Uh, we also did some, some research, and I'll just mention a couple of, of, of findings, um, that, that research that hadn't been done before, which um, helped in particular um, with um, the adoption of due diligence requirements. So, for example, in the mining industry, a, a world-class mining operation that costs four or five billion U.S. dollars to get operational, if there is a, uh, 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 an interruption of uh, the uh, operation, twenty million dollars a week. Um, one of the oil um, international oil majors, um, at our urging, did an analysis of how much money they lost due to what they called stakeholder-related risk. In other words, delays and, and blowing up pipelines, kidnapping personnel, et cetera, et cetera. They came to the conclusion that it was $6.5 billion over a two-year period. Now, that kind of research gets the attention um, even of the biggest uh, multinational companies and they began to see the virtue of participating in this kind of um, effort. So what do we take away, Kishore, for global governance? Um, 
One, that the conventional approaches don't move fast enough, um, they don't work well enough because the issues are too complex, the interests too divergent, um, and geopolitical changes in the world um, 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 increase the, the sort of centrifugal um, uh, uh, forces that make it um, increasingly uh, unlikely that we're going to get top-down uh, command and control regulation over important issues such as business and human rights or climate change for that matter and that we need uh, different approaches uh, to doing um, these, um, these kinds, uh, dealing with these kinds of issues. The guiding principles, I believe, demonstrate that it is possible to develop um, uh, standards that are authoritative without being law, hard law standards, but then become incorporated in policy requirements uh, and even national legal um, requirements. It's an example, as I indicated earlier, uh, of polycentric uh, governments, um, governance, and also um, a phrase uh, that I use to describe um, the planting the seeds in a diversity of, of entities, implementation through distributed networks rather than um, hoping that somehow when you have an agreement at the UN, things will trickle down um, and, 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 and take root um, um, on their own. Um, and then um, the um, international law, um, which, which obviously uh, is, is, an, is an, an important um, architectural feature of global governance, um, fills specific gaps um, that um, um, when consensus can already be uh, established um, around um, particular uh, legal uh, instruments. And my final slide, which um, Kishore already held up, just business, just as you know, has two meanings. Uh, and um, one is in accordance with principles of justice, with principles of fairness. And the other is ordinary normal practice. And what we have tried to do is to bring those two meanings closer together. That the way in which to achieve um, justice um, is to make the, um, uh, conduct um, more aligned uh, with um, um, principles of justice by making them just part of everyday conduct. And that's um, what we have been trying to uh, achieve with the UN guiding principles. So I've taken you through a lot of territory in a relatively short period of time, um, but um, I'm happy to deal uh, with any questions or elaborations that, uh, uh, or engage in, in arguments, if you like, uh, with you. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you. Thank you, John. That was uh, fascinating. Uh, I get to ask the first question before we throw the floor open to everybody. You know, I'm glad you mentioned in, in the course of your remarks that one of the challenges we face is that the markets are integrating, but the regulatory authorities are disintegrated, you know. And I try to describe the, the danger this creates by using a, a simple metaphor in my book. I say that the way the world has changed is that in the past, when 7 billion people live in 193 separate countries, it was as though they were in 193 separate boats with captains and crews taking care of each boat mm. and rules to make sure the boats didn't collide. But today, as a result of global integration, the 7 billion people no longer live in 193 separate boats. They live in 193 separate cabins on the same boat. But you have captains and crews taking care of each cabin, but no captain or crew taking care of the global boat as a whole. And that's how I describe the fundamental challenge. And that's why I think global governance, more global governance is needed. Now, we, obviously, we're not going to get global government. That's impossible. But listening to you, especially your closing slide, do you see uh, either principles or practices that you have learned in the course of trying to improve governance in business and human rights that could then be taken to other challenging areas? Let's take climate change, for example. Uh, are there things you learn from this area that say, hey, 
maybe if we apply the same pragmatic method, we might actually get a better solution to climate change than having governments locked up in a room trying to find a solution. So um, what's your answer to that? Uh, absolutely is my answer to that. Um, but first, let me say that um, I, I, I understand now with your metaphor why your books sell so much better than mine do. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true, by the way. <laughs> but um, I, I, you know, I, I, I do believe the, the area of, of climate change obviously is a hugely complex uh, yeah. area, but I don't think the, 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 the world was done a great service mm. uh, by um, uh, try, trying to um, achieve the goals through um, uh, the Kyoto Protocol, mm. um, a, a top-down kind of negotiation, uh, particularly because of, uh, or in addition, I should say, mm. uh, because of the asymmetry of obligations that were built into mm. uh, the Kyoto Protocol as well. But the idea that you can take um, one of the most complex issues on the face of the, of, of, of the earth mm. uh, involving all of our industrial and agricultural activity, all of our transportation systems and mm. all the rest of it, and that you can drive it top down through a treaty process, mm. it, it just, it, it, it never made much sense to me, um, and it clearly mm. um, has set the agenda back. Mm. Um, whereas, um, um, you know, you, 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 can't, you can't deal with climate change um, with, with, without addressing the various um, uh, issues that go into um, producing um, the, the, the climate change forces in the first place. Mm. So a, a, a more bottom-up, um, aligning national policies, mutual recognition of approaches, I, I, th I thought would have worked much better. I think that's where we're going. But um, it's been a long time um, getting there. But can you, tr with, with your experience now, go back and persuade the U.S. government and tell the United States government, hey, do you want to try a new approach to climate change, uh, you know, solving, how do you solve the climate change problem with you? Can you persuade, the, let's say, the, if, you went, if you had 10 minutes with Obama, could you tell him, hey, try doing this? Well, actually, I think Obama is, is uh, um, uh, on the right track. Um, mm. Hillary Clinton was on the right track. She kept talking about, about uh, you know, the, 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 the stoves that, that women in developing countries cook on mm. uh, and the emissions that come from those and having more efficient or perhaps solar-driven, uh, mm. you know, uh, stoves to cook on. Mm. It, it's something that, it, it, that we could have dealt with um, v very easily and build on those kinds of concrete mm. and discrete elements. But I think that's, that is the Obama approach. And I think uh, the, uh, the, the discussions between uh, Obama and China on this issue, uh, on climate change generally, are much more productive these days than they were when the treaty itself was at issue. Mm -hmm. And how is it more productive? Bec because I, uh, the... the um, uh, they're addressing um, not, um, uh, the, not the issue of adhering to particular emission standards in the aggregate, but rather concrete elements uh, on which an agreement is possible, um, and, and then building up from there. Mm. Great. So we have in about half an hour or so. The floor is open. Please stand up, uh, identify yourself. Ask a very short, sharp question. <laughs> I think I can't make a short, sharp question because I had to give you some background on this case. My name is Victoria Go. I'm just coming hey, put here. The as mic, bring the mic down, please. I'm just coming here as an individual. I don't represent any organization. Uh, I would like to sort of extend a bit your, uh, take a different perspective on what you have said on business in human rights. And I want to bring to your attention the case of Sombat Sompon. I don't know whether you have heard of the case of Sombat Sompon. He's a Maxese Award winner who disappeared in December last year. And, in, uh, in, in Laos, is it? In Laos. Okay. And apparently, uh, this, this was after he participated very actively under the People's Forum, which was under the ASEAN EU meeting in Vientiane. And just before his disappearance, the head of a Swiss NGO was asked to leave the country in 48 hours. Also, the person who participated very actively in the People's Forum. So apparently, 
uh, the people who participated in the People's Forum were a bit too enthusiastic. And some governments in this region uh, actually do view non-governmental organizations even as anti-government organizations. So subsequent, uh, subsequently, I think ASEAN sent three ASEAN MPs to investigate. And the conclusion of this three ASEAN MPs was the civilian government is running around in circles. The power lies with the Communist Party, with the Politburo, with the military. They were going to report to the ASEAN Human Rights Commission, which met subsequently. And the ASEAN Human Rights Commission held its first meeting. Nothing was mentioned about this. Apparently, they dealt only with administrative issues. Now, in the face of all this, what can be done if people who participated and supported the ASEAN meetings are treated this way by the ASEAN, by ASEAN itself? I think in this part of the world, there's very little known of human rights. People are not comfortable with talking about human rights. And you can lose a lot of friends if you start talking about human rights. And uh, there is no education as it is in maybe in Europe where they are educated right from primary school on human rights. So what is the role of maybe, I mean, if I tell a businessman from Singapore, from a, a SME about human rights, he will tell me, but this has nothing to do with me. It's not my business. So what is the role of maybe academia, maybe Professor Kishore? I mean, your, you, you, you people have maybe a bigger role to play because if the concept itself of human rights is not with people, how are they going to do anything? I'm not even talking about the big MNCs. I'm talking about the small businessmen. It doesn't exist in the brains of many people here. Yeah. So can we have some comments, please? Well, she, that was addressed to you. You're not. You're, <laughs> you know, you're not doing a good enough job teaching. <laughs> no, no. I think that, I mean the, the Laotian case is obviously a very distressing one, and I actually haven't found out the, the the facts what happened, but it's troubling, and it's a sign that this region has a long way to go. Basically, uh, in terms of implementing many of these uh, human rights provisions and. The record has been imperfect. It's two steps forward, one step backward, one step sideways, and that's true of this uh, region. But uh, I hope, anyway, that maybe you, you can address the fact how your work can help to influence cases like this in, in ASEAN. By the way, tonight he's leaving for Jakarta, and tomorrow he's going to address the Indonesian parliament. So you're going to address the largest ASEAN country. What will your message be to them? <laughs> well, I'd, I'll be meeting with, uh, with, with members, with, with all uh, representatives of, of the ASEAN countries as well. Mm. Um, I don't know if I'll have an opportunity to take up this particular issue, but uh, I think you put it well, Kishore, that um, this is part of, of an evolutionary development. Um, it's part of a learning process. Um, I, I, I understand very well that... Um, um, in, in this region and in some other parts of the world, um, the concept of human rights um, in relation to business activity um, ha has not s fully taken root. Uh, but um, I was very encouraged uh, when the Human Rights Council uh, endorsed the guiding principles uh, in the preamble to the resolution they stated that this is an important contribution to a socially sustainable globalization. Now, why do I think that's important? Because I think it, 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 it uh, uh, recognizes that this is not um, simply uh, uh, a, 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 a Western human rights thing. This is not East or West. It's not Asian values versus other values. This has to do with making our economic system um, socially sustainable, that is to say, um, in harmony with the needs and dignity of human beings. My favorite boss, Kofi Annan, once said, um, if we cannot make globalization work for everybody, in the end it will work for nobody uh, because it'll collapse under its own weight and that's the recognition that is sinking in among more and more governments 
uh, including, um, if I may say so, the Chinese government, from, uh, citing um, that news report uh, that I mentioned before. Uh, it's a clear recognition um, that uh, you can't operate, um, especially large-scale uh, business activities, uh, without taking into account uh, those on whom you have an impact um, and, 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 and meeting certain minimal standards um, of human dignity and respect. Great. Please, question over the back, yes. I also noticed some law professors here in this room. I hope they'll join the discussion. <laughs> Hello, uh, good evening. I'm Sam, and I work in the uh, project finance space for natural resource uh, industry. So I feel the problem of uh, business and human rights uh, quite keenly. Thank you very much for taking the time to share with us what you've done. Um, there was one slide that caught my particular attention where you showed this sort of multifaceted nature of the problem where you said uh, which organizations were responsible for the uh, collapse in uh, Bangladesh. And one of the facets I thought or I think is going to be um, increasingly important is the consumer which um, you didn't really show there. Because, I mean, take the example, and I've asked a few of my friends this before, mostly uh, women. If someone were to give you two exactly uh, the same sort of diamond rings, but one for a third of the price, I mean, we all know why it's a third of the price. It's, it's a really difficult decision to make because a commodity, because a consumer wants that commodity to be priced at the lowest amount, which presumably is why Walmart is famous for its clothing. So I was just wondering about your thoughts on sort of where the consumer fits into this picture of human rights and business, and maybe where this also f the consumer fits into the framework or the, the sort of UN framework and you know, yeah, things like that. Thanks. Well, I, I guess um, I included um, the consumer in the broader concept of, of civil society. Um, consumer pressure obviously is important. Activists can play on consumer um, interests and consumer concerns, but you know, of course you're right. Um, the average person would rather not pay more for a, a, a product um, uh, if they can avoid it, um, uh, unless um, it can be demonstrated that, that there has been clear harm um, committed, and that certainly has been the case. Uh, um, in, in the apparel industry, um, um, the, 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 the challenge um, is, uh, it, it, it's, it's enormous. Uh, you know, the apparel industry has been the point of entry for, for, um, um, in, for uh, development, economic development, since the Industrial Revolution uh, in, the, in, in, in Britain. And there have been series of disasters uh, and people learn from the disasters, they, they, they pass adequate regulation. Um, there is pressure from the outside. Um, in this case, um, in, uh, in the uh, Rana uh, uh, case, um, the uh, major Western brands are increasingly looking elsewhere uh, to, uh, to produce their products. Um, there is a, 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 a mass migration taking place to Indonesia. Uh, which has, you know, um, um, the um, has adequate infrastructure, uh, and so on and so forth. So the the, the cost um, to the government involved, the cost to the factory owners, is going to be considerable uh, for, for um, ignoring um, the uh, the sort of the fundamentals um, and, and and basic standards. Um, in the Bangladesh. Um, I, th I think the apparel industry accounts for something like 20% of GDP and something like 80% of export earnings, um, and uh, they're going to suffer significantly as a result of um, not paying attention and not enforcing um, regulations adequately to prevent these kinds of disasters. And it's in part because consumers are, are reacting the way they have to, uh, to, to these kinds of um, situations. Please, in front here. Yeah. Uh, Professor John, uh, hi, I'm Robin. I'm the uh, member of the Singapore Press Club and as well as the uh, online talk show host from New York. Uh, my question is this, is uh, how has Just Business, your book that you've just written, uh, has inspired you 
Yeah, could you share with us three key points that we, the the, uh, the kind of uh, experience that you have learned from, and how we, uh, as readers that's going to buy your book, are able to benefit? Well, I think you should buy multiple copies and give them away as as, <laughs> as, as birthday presents. Right? Um, the book is a ref is is a reflection on the process that I tried to describe today. Um, and I think the, the, fundamental, um, the fundamental lesson that I took away from it is how important it is to frame issues uh, in a way that cut across the usual divisions. So in the area of human rights, as I mentioned before, we've had these long-standing uh, debates uh, uh, about different, different values, different principles. What's Western? What's Asian? What's North? What's South? Um, finding ways to cut across those kinds of uh, divisions um, is fundamentally important. Uh, and one way to have done that here is to address the issue as one of socially sustainable uh, activity, business conduct, right? Um, another um, uh, reframing that played a key role, I think, uh, in the success um, uh, such as it has been with the guiding principles in which I discuss in the book um, is the, there have been long-standing debates between should things be mandatory, should things be voluntary. Uh, it, it takes on theological dimensions after a while. Um, and so my approach was, look, much of what um, needs to be done can be done beyond voluntarism, but short of globally binding standards. Um, so let's find a way to, to, uh, to express those get businesses engaged, um, and if they do it based on their own self-interest, that's okay. I'm okay with, doing, with having people do the right thing. I don't care why they do the right thing. Um, it, 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 it's it's, a, it's a essentially um, the approach that I describe in the book as printable pragmatism, right? Um, there are certain principles that I'm utterly committed to and I'm willing to try just about anything to get from here to there. Um, I'm not, I don't have a religious commitment to any particular approach, including multilateralism. Right? If multilateralism doesn't work, try something else. Uh, and then see if you can come back to, if you can reach agreements on a bilateral basis, see if you can then hook it back to and spread the word on a, on a more multilateral basis. So it's cutting across the, 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 the standard sort of gaps uh, of discourse and understanding um, that I, um, I, I tried to, uh, to tease out uh, in, in the book. Is it, is it fair to say, by the way, that uh, when you started this process, that the business groups were initially skeptical, all things trying to link business with human rights, but over time, they came to understand, actually, it's in their interest to do so. Would that be a fair description? I think that's fair. I mean, business does generally doesn't like regulation, and they viewed this as a form of regulation. And the fact is, they're right. It is a form of regulation. It's intended to be a form of regulation. But it's a, it's a form of regulation that, that makes sense. I think, ultimately, business understands that you cannot sustain a globally integrated economy without any kind of... Uh, a regulatory infrastructure that deals not only with protecting business interests, such as um, the bilateral investment treaties or the intellectual property rights, but that also provides social protection. Great. Ted, I'm going to give uh, uh, Ted first, and I'll come to you because he's a PhD student of Professor John Ruggie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ted Hoff, um, NUS Political Science. John, I was, I was hoping you'd take an opportunity to reflect on the relationship between IR theory and policy, because you're one of the rare human beings on this Earth. This is a tough question. Oh, no, it's, it's very easy, because I'm sitting here. Th 30 years ago, John wrote uh, about a concept he called embedded liberalism, which uh, he basically derived from... Em embedded what, sorry? Embedded liberalism. There was a, yeah. A concept which he derived from his reading of Karl Polanyi's Great Transformation. And as I'm, as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking that you're actually implementing embedded liberalism or a version of it globally. I mean, you're, are you actually, when you're at the UN working on an issue such as just business, are you thinking about how you can apply the lessons of Karl Polanyi to international politics? And if you could say a little bit more, well, just say a little bit more about, I mean, because you teach at a school of public policy. At Columbia, you taught both political science and public policy. You're at a school of public policy. 
And usually there's quite a bit of tension between the IR theory crowd and the public policy crowd, but you're like a, a living embodiment of fruitfully combining both. Well, he's a living contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ted, for, for, for that question. You know, I, I was told that, um, yeah. that the uh, academic term had ended uh, and there wouldn't be many students here, and so I, I, <laughs> um, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, address um, the issue of international relations theory as, as much as I would have um, uh, if, if the academic term were still on, but you're absolutely right. Um, this draws, um, um, it draws on my practical experience in the UN, of course, um, but it also draws on, on uh, sort of long-standing scholarly interests um, uh, of, of how um, to um, reconcile um, social, uh, and market, uh, social needs and market forces, which has been a long-standing interest uh, uh, of mine, and also um, a long-standing interest in the study of norms how norms are established, how norms get disseminated, um, and, um, um, and, and the, the, the whole um, uh, sort of theory of norm cascades, cascading and so on and so forth is all, was all in, in, the, in, the, in the backdrop um, of this. Um, I, I'm not sure I'm a living contradiction, but I do try to reconcile the irreconcilable um, um, and every once in a while I succeed, uh, whether it's theory and practice, whether it's market and society, or whatever the case may be. So, but thank you for asking the question, and you're absolutely right that, um, um, that the, 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 the sort of the backdrop to um, a lot of my uh, approach to this um, was uh, through um, um, some of the theoretical work that you referred to. Gentleman and in my next life, I'm going to go back and do a theory uh, book on okay. what we've now done in the policy world. Okay. And, and after this young man, another IR professor has a <laughs> deep question for you. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for your talk, Professor. Um, I'm a doctoral researcher at the Faculty of Law. I have two questions. Um, the first question has to do with the three with the threefold approach that you that the UN took in the in the guiding principles, and in relation to the approach to businesses, my question is: How do you distinguish between human non-compliance with human rights as a risk to business from other forms of risk which seem to be very much related to the instances you refer to, such as political risk, and this has to do with the second question, and the second question has to do with a recent development that is of importance to the protection of human rights. And this is the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States in the Hobel versus Royal Dutch Petroleum case, in which it decided that the principle of uh, an, uh, against extraterritorial um, applic um, application of of law and exercise of jurisdiction applies to the institute under which human rights litigation against multinational companies has always been brought. So my question in this second regard in relation to this development is twofold. First, wouldn't this non-availability of a domestic remedy that has proved to be very important in practical terms reduce the risk of, business, of businesses engaging in non-compliance of human rights? And secondly, uh, do you, what are your views as to this development? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me begin with the second one. Well, the two are closely related. Um, the case that, um, that uh, was referred to uh, was um, a recent case in the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, um, Nigerian plaintiffs brought a case against Shell in U.S. courts. Um, for acts um, um, that um, the, 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 the claimants uh, said um, um, included torture, uh, extrajudicial killings. This is the Nigerian military dictatorship in the, in the 1990s, uh, protecting as, uh, Shell's assets um, and um, um, engaging in violent behavior um, to put down um, uh, the Ogoni uh, uh, people, uh, the, the Ogoni uh, movement, liberation movement, 
uh, in Nigeria. So the case was brought in U.S. courts under the, something called the Alien Tort Statute, which goes back to 1789 um, and has been, um, was rarely used uh, until the 1980s when human rights lawyers discovered it as a, as a way to bring um, um, uh, cases against human rights abusers. Even, even if they were foreign and the, the conduct took place on foreign soil, bring it uh, in U.S. courts. So the issue here was uh, whether um, the statute applied to the case uh, of Shell. And the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously uh, that um, it did not because the, 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 the nexus, the connection to the United States was not close enough. Um, it was um, on foreign soil, by foreign parties, against foreign claimants, um, and involving a foreign company. Now, the Supreme Court left open the door uh, to bringing cases against companies um, that are more, wh where the conduct uh, in question is more closely associated with the United States. Now, does this decision um, reduce the risk to business um, of litigation? Um, and does it affect the calculus that I've outlined that business um, 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 has increasingly considered uh, in the area of business and human rights? I think in the short run, the answer may be yes, but I'm not sure that it's true in the long run. Um, and um, let me explain why. Uh, first of all, because um, it, is, um, uh, it is increasingly common to see the host countries where the operation of the company takes place, um, um, allowing or, 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 or having their courts hear cases. Nigerian courts have now heard cases against Shell in Nigeria. Secondly, um, it is increasingly um, possible to bring cases in the home country of the company. Uh, so cases have been brought against Shell in the Netherlands its home country, uh, including for negligence of the parent company in inadequately overseeing the activities of subsidiaries. So um, even though one link um, may be diminished, other links are, are um, emerging. Um, now, the question of overall um, risk uh, assessment by companies um, my sense is that major multinational corporations, once they get over the initial sort of, and, and most of them are, 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 are there, uh, once they get over the initial hang-up about human rights and business, what's this got to do with business, why isn't this you know, the business of governments, once they get over, over that, um, the, the, uh, and if you provide them with tools that, whereby they can readily integrate um, the issue of, of human rights into their own ongoing risk assessment processes and management systems, um, you can make very good progress in a very short period of time. Uh, and my, my, my major example um, of, of, uh, uh, of significant process, progress in a relatively short period of time is in fact with China. Three years ago, you could, you, two years ago, you would not have seen China doing in Myanmar what China is doing in Myanmar now. Now, you know, there's, there's obviously there is public relations involved here. There's all sorts of things involved here that, um, but nevertheless, um, you know, uh, you would not have seen uh, the Chinese embassy open a, a uh, or, or assign a political officer to do nothing but relate to the communities along the pipeline corridor. Uh, and to engage the communities and to provide social investments to communities along the way. Um, th this could not have happened two, three years ago, and it's changing very rapidly. Okay, Kanti, the last question. I'm sorry, because he has a catch a flight at 8 o'clock, so another IR professor. Oh, yeah, I know him. Fun. Yeah. yeah, we met years ago. <laughs> um, this is a question about um, business and political rights. Um, and so I guess my question is, in the... Ruggy report and Ruggy rules. Uh, is there aversion to the issue of should businesses, uh, as a normative thing at least, be pushing governments on uh, political rights? Um, should they use their business power? Should they withhold investment? 
Should they uh, consider uh, investments in countries conditional on their human rights records? I mean, the sense I have is that what you've talked about essentially is uh, businesses' obligations in the workplace or in terms of externalities that they may cause and restitution towards, you know, if they cause environmental damage to, to make sure they, they uh, provide restitutive of uh, payment and so on. But what about uh, uh, flagrant human rights abuses on people, violence by governments or inter-ethnic problems that, that, uh, uh, you know, that occur? Um, should governments, uh, is there stuff in your report that deals with that? Uh, I think a lot of people probably think about uh, the human rights issue in those terms much more than perhaps in the terms that you've outlined? Well, I think it, it's a good question. Um, I, it, it's a very tricky area. It's a very, it's very tricky territory. Um, you know, there is a movement um, uh, in some of the uh, NGO community that companies should do responsible lobbying, right? Um, now, who gets to define what responsible lobbying is? Um, now, does this lobbying for political change, does it have to be public? Does it have to, can it be private? How do you know what takes place in private? And so on and so forth. The approach that we took um, um, in, in um, our mandate and in the guiding principles is that companies should not be involved in human rights abuses um, through their um, own conduct or through their business relationships. Now, their business relationships obviously can include governments. I showed the picture before of the 16th Army Brigade. The 16th Army Brigade was protecting BP assets. People were being killed. BP knew that people were being killed. Therefore, by definition, they were involved in those extrajudicial killings. So what our... Um, guiding principles address is the responsibility of BP not to be involved in, that, uh, in business relationships that lead to that kind of, of, of consequence. Uh, it doesn't mean that BP has to reform the government of Colombia in the, in the process, but it needs to make sure that its business relationships do not contribute or are involved in human rights harm. Thank you. Okay. Well, on that note, I'm afraid uh, since he has to catch a flight at uh, 8 o'clock to Jakarta, and we don't want to deprive the Indonesian parliament of an opportunity to hear him, I hope you'll now join me in thanking him for this incredibly stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. The Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy.